everyone. Welcome to Azure Biosystems live webinar. I'm Kai Ling, the Regional Field Application Scientist of Azure Biosystems. Today, I will bring us back to the basics where we're going to look at the fundamental experimental design of a qPCR assay. First, I will give a brief introduction to the real-time PCR and its basic components. Then, how a good experimental design will reduce biological variability before we run the qPCR. Next, we will look at the considerations and concerns in obtaining the nucleic acid template as well as the primer design and validation to produce a reproducible and publication quality qPCR data. And finally, I will briefly introduce our newly launched Azure Cielo real-time PCR systems. Let me introduce real-time PCR and its components to you. Real-time PCR, also called as qPCR, where the Q stands for quantitative and PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. Polymerase chain reaction is a method that used widely in molecular biology to make millions to billions of copies of a specific fragments of DNA. Real-time PCR or qPCR is a specialized technique that allows a PCR reaction to be visualized in real time as the reaction progresses. As we will see, qPCR allows us to quantitate minute or small amounts of DNA sequences in a sample. Just like a regular PCR, in a qPCR reaction, DNA doubles exponentially after every cycle at the rate of 2 to the power of n, where n stands for the cycle number. qPCR uses a DNA binding dyes or probe-based detection chemistry to record or monitor fluorescent signals in real time. Exponential phase of qPCR is the earliest segment in the PCR where product increases exponentially. It is the ideal phase for quantitation because the reagents are not limited and it represents the true doubling of the target. The CQ value or the quantification cycle value is the Q is at which the qPCR cycle number at which your sample reaction curves intersect with the threshold line. So this threshold line is the point where you start to see a steady doubling. qPCR value are direct, is directly related to the starting quantity of DNA by way of the formula DNA amount or the DNA quantity equals to 2 to the power of CQ value. Under the perfect situation, when you plot the standard curve where the log of the copy number is the x-axis, and the CQ values are the y-axis, you will get a linear curve with the r square value reaching to 1. That means the qPCR efficiency is reaching 100%. In a perfect and well-controlled scenario, where there is no pipetting error, nucleic acid, contamination and so on, these are the qPCR results you will see. 
let's say you're detecting gene expression X in a sample with three technical replicates. Since these are the replicates of a single sample, you should see a uniform aligned amplification curves where all of them have almost the same CQ values. And you should also see the nice single nice melt curve peaks at the same temperature, telling you that gene X is targeted and amplified in all these replicates. Before we go into details on how to produce a good qPCR result and how you know that they are indeed the amplicons of gene X, we should know how does a qPCR works. This is a simplified diagram that shows us the qPCR thermal cycles. qPCR consists of a series of thermal cycles with each cycle consisting of denaturation, annealing and extension steps, plus a DNA doubling measurement by detecting the fluorescent signals. These cycles, this cycle will be repeated for 35 to 40 cycles. Then we can analyze the qPCR data. In qPCR, we need to add five materials into a reaction tube. These five materials are, firstly, nucleic acid template, second, primers, the third one should be fluorescent reporter, DNTP, and tech polymerase. Nucleic acid template is the nucleic acid template you should use uh, uh, that you get from your sample serve as a template in this qPCR where you want to detect and quantitate the expression from it. Primer is a short DNA sequence that targets specific regions of the nucleic acid template. Frozen reporter can be a DNA binding dye such as cybergreen or fluorescently labeled qPCR probe or primer that emit fluorescent signal. DNTP, also known as deoxyribonucleotide triphosphate, are the building blocks of the nucleotide that will allow to build new DNA sequence. And TEC polymerase is a thermal stable DNA polymerase enzyme that allows generate, to generate new copies of DNA with the help of primer and DNTPs. All these materials are the factors in qPCR optimization. But today, we will only focus on nucleic acid template and primer design. Answering the biological questions with a good experimental design is the first and essential step in every single scientific project. Although qPCR technique is generally perceived to be relatively simple, there are a few steps and reagents that require optimization and validation. This is to ensure that we can get reproducible data that can accurately reflect the biological questions being posed. Without following a strict guideline, optimization and validations, the qPCR results you get can be far from valid. With that, we have my key guidelines that stands for minimum information for publication of a quantitative real-time PCR experiment and other related methodology articles to help us generate a rigor, reproducible, and reliable qPCR data. This also drives the usage of RDML files in the scientific community. RDML stands for 
real-time PCR data markup language. It is an instrument independent format to store and exchange raw fluorescence qPCR data. For qPCR, we must first identify or determine the qPCR assay type. It can be gene expression profiling, viral title determination, copy number variation analysis, and allelic discrimination assay. Each of them has different biological questions to be answered, and that will affect the assay design and also the controls to be included. In the context of gene expression profiling, it is the most common qPCR assay type that enables users to relatively quantitate the changes in gene expression in each sample relative to another reference sample, such as an untreated control sample. For example, we want to measure the gene expression X in response to a drug treatment. The CQ values of the test sample is normalized to the reference sample that serves as a baseline. Hence, the quality control of nucleic acid template obtained in these two groups and also the primer designed are crucial in giving us a reproducible qPCR data. In the process of getting the nucleic acid template for qPCR, a good experimental design will reduce the biological variability between the test conditions. Biological variability is the most challenging aspect of qPCR experiments because transcriptome, or we can say gene expression, is highly sensitive to the inherent biological differences between samples. Careful plans on the sourcing, randomized selection, and the number of samples per biological group must be conducted to ensure statistically significant and reproducible qPCR result. For example, choose the best target, sample, and treatments based on previously acquired data or validated literature. Second, define the appropriate biological groups, such as the need to include a knockdown or knockout group in the experiment, or at which time point you should harvest the sample or you should do a treatment, and etc. All these depending on the biological questions, and thirdly, define, oh, sorry. Okay, and also, depends on the biological questions, you need to do biological and technical replicates to reduce the errors. And finally, observe unusual changes to ensure the consistency in experimental conditions. These considerations are highly dependent on the biological questions, the novelty of it, the existence of previous literature, time, manpower, equipment, and cost. So bear in mind that there is no one size fit all in terms of a good experimental design. So let's say we have a suitable and feasible experimental design for gene expression profiling, and we are working towards obtaining the nucleic acid template for qPCR experiment. There are two major aspects of quality control in getting the nucleic acid template. First is RNA purification and quantitation, where we extract RNA from test samples. Second is the reverse transcription, where we reverse transcribe the extracted RNA to a complementary DNA 
and also what we call as cDNA. First up, in RNA extraction procedure, use appropriate homogenization method for different tissue and cell types. Be sure to check the publication and literature to choose the most suitable method so we can get a good yield of total RNA with high purity. Second, use nuclease-free extraction reagents. In this case, it means RNA-free reagents because you don't want your RNA to be degraded before running the qPCR. Also, we can treat the RNA extract with DNAs to remove genomic DNA carryover because the existence of genomic DNA in your RNA extract can compromise the efficiencies of the qPCR reaction due to the competition for reaction components such as DNTPs and primers. Now, we have RNA extracts. It is time to assess the quality and quantity of it. This can be done by reading the absorbance at a spectrophotometer, or we can call, or we can use a nano drop. RNA with a good quality will show a ratio of 1.8 or higher for absorbance 260 to 280, and a ratio value of 2.0 or higher for uh, absorbance 260 to 230. A ratio of 260 and 280 below 1.8 can indicate protein contamination, which can lower qPCR reaction efficiency. And the ratio of 260 and 230 is helpful in evaluating the carryover of components containing phenol rings or salt, which are inhibitory to the enzymatic reaction we're going to do later on. So we have our RNA, it is in good quality and quantity. The next thing we need to check is the RNA integrity. Run about 400 nanogram per RNA sample on a bleach gel. We should see two RNA bands on the gel. They are the 28S and 18S ribosomal RNA bands. The 28S RNA band should be at the same brightness or higher than 18S RNA band. The reason to use a bleach gel is to eliminate the presence of RNAs in the gel. If we see a degraded and smeared lane in the bleach gel, we can confirm that the RNA is indeed degraded during or after we extracted it. If the RNA samples are precious and limited, we can use an automated electrophoresis instrument like the bioanalyzer. The RNA integrity number, the RIN, should be, should have at least 7.0 and above. This shows that the RNA is intact and in good quality. Okay, next, we will reverse transcribe the pure and intact RNA to cDNA. cDNA is a nucleic acid template for this case. The choice of reverse transcriptase enzyme is also important. Ideally, it should be thermostable with reduced RNAH activity. Thermostable reverse transcriptase enzyme allows successful reverse transcription of a GC-rich region. RNAH domain in the reverse transcriptase enzyme can drastically reduce the yield of full-length cDNA, which later translates to poor sensitivity. 
some of the reverse transcriptase enzymes such as superscript 2, 3 have been engineered for reduced RNA's H activity. Therefore, they yield higher full-length cDNA. Before we reverse transcribe the RN extracted RNA sample, we should standardize all of them to the same approximate concentration by dilution. Then, use the same amount of total RNA from each sample for reverse transcription. We must not forget to choose a good reverse transcription kit. Normally, it comes with a mix of oligo -DT and random hexamer for complete coverage, RNase inhibitor to prevent RNA degradation, and a robust <coughs> enzyme mix to reverse transcribe RNA at a broad range of concentration. We can also find the optimal quantity of cDNA by testing different amounts of um, total RNA. If we realize that the starting amount of the nucleic acid template in the qPCR run is too low or too high. All right, now we have our cDNA or the nucleic acid template ready. Next, we should have a set of prime primer pairs that is optimal for qPCR reaction. qPCR reaction efficiency is the pivot of accurate qPCR data. Under an ideal scenario, each target copy in a qPCR reaction will be copied at each cycle and double the amount of full-length target what we also call as Ambicon. This is what we call as 100% amplification efficiency that mathematically gives us this formula to determine the DNA amounts in our sample. A good, a good primer design allows us to have close to 100% amplification efficiency and later give us the accurate and true QBCR data. A good primer pairs should amplify relatively short but specific amplicons, roughly around 80 to 150 base pair. They should also generate a region of medium GC content that will avoid the formation of secondary structures in the amplicons. These are a few considerations when we design the primers. First, it falls between 18 to 30 bases. Having a medium a GC content, 40 to 60 percent of it. The melting temperature should be within 55 to 60 degrees Celsius. And most importantly, the differences of the melting temperature between your forward and reverse primer should not exceed, exceed 4 degrees Celsius. Best is within 1 degree Celsius or the same. When you design the primer, try to avoid mismatches between the primers and the target, whereby avoiding 3 prime and T in the primer. We should also avoid stretches of repeated nucleotides in the primer. For example, more than 3G or Cs at 3 prime N. In the case such as a GGG or CCC at the 3 prime ends in the primer, we should avoid this. Next up, we should avoid complementary T's within the primers to avoid hairpin formation. Not only about that, we also should avoid the complementary teeth between the primers, between the forward and reverse primers, to avoid primer dimers formation, especially of two or more bases at the three prime end of the primers. 
we must also check the target specific specificity and the unique of the primers with a blast search at NCBI website. As we know, genomic DNA can be compromised the efficiency of a qPCR reaction. These can be solved by designing an intron spanning or intron flanking primers. This is a figure a diagram telling you how the intron spanning primer works. For intron spanning primers, the first half of the oligo or the primer should hybridize to the three prime end of one exon and also to the five prime end of the other exon. So in this way, only the cDNA will be amplified, but not the genomic DNA. After we design the primers, based on the listed consideration, we must validate primers to access their annealing temperature, milk curve, and amplicon size. Thermal gradient and agarose gel will be used for primer validation. The protein and chemical contaminants in nucleic acid extracts can affect primer annealing. So first, we prepare a 1 in 20 diluted cDNA sample from an equalized pool of samples from each treatment condition or biological groups. In another word, I take one microlit of cDNA of every single sample and pull them together into one single tube. Then I dilute it at 1 in 20 dilution. Then, I run this diluted cDNA sample on a thermal gradient of the annealing temperature, which is typically between 51 to 63 degrees Celsius. This allows us to determine the optimal annealing temperature, the average levels of expression, and the unique product for each target from the melt curve and gel analysis. The amplicon can be visualized on the single melt curve peaks at the same temperature and also by running an agarose gel where ideally you should see a single sharp band at the correct molecular weight. Then sequence the amplicon to ensure that this is your qPCR target. Next, the quantitation cycle, the CQ value, from the optimal annealing temperature range can be used as a guide to establish the standard curve dilution factor for each target. Subsequent standard curve analysis is critical because only when the reaction efficiency is close to 100%, the CQ values represent the target concentration in each sample. For each primer pair, perform an 8-point standard curve from the pooled cDNA sample we have earlier serially dilute the cDNA based on the expression level per primer. So let's say the lower CQ value we observed in the previous thermal gradient is between falls between 10 to 16. We should dilute them uh, to 1 in 8 dilution. This should cover the widest dynamic range possible. Based on the standard curve, the amplification efficiency as determined from the slope, should range between 90 to 110%. The dilution factor from the midpoint is then used to dilute the individual experimental ex samples per target, assuming that the pooled cDNA sample we have before 
represent the average abundance of each target for the experiment. This is to ensure minimal presence of contaminants affecting primer efficiency and accurate quantitative data. Then, these accurate CQ values will reflect the two, two concentration of targets in each sample with minimal variability between the samples within a biological group. Following the quality controls and considerations in getting nucleic acid templates and design a good pair of primers, we can at least confirm that the primers are at their optimal melting temperature, giving you a target-specific and accurate result without worry about the reduction of qPCR reaction efficiency that comes from primer dimer, perhaps not fully reverse transcribed cDNA or other non-optimized situation. So this is a general experimental design in gene expression profiling qPCR assay that we have addressed two important and fundamental components of a qPCR reaction. This is just barely scratched the surface. So if you want to learn more, I would highly recommend you check out the MyKey guidelines and other methodology articles that tabulate a stepwise approach in doing a qPCR experiment. Next, please allow me to briefly introduce our newly launched Azul Cielo real-time PCR system to you. Azul Bio Systems offering a full range of leading products to the market. We have been specializing as protein expression imaging since 2014. Our company founded in 2013 and we based in Dublin, California in the United States, where all our products are designed, developed and manufactured there. The core member of Azul Biosystems are coming from Alpha Inotech. Therefore, we have been focusing on providing innovative imaging system for protein expression. This year, the year of 2020, we launched our flagship Azul Cielo real-time PCR systems to provide a complete expression workflow to the users. It is an open platform supporting both dye and probe-based chemistry in qPCR reaction. In terms of performance, Azul Cielo has a unique optical design that delivers more sensitivity, speed, and multiplex capabilities. It is flexible due to the nature of an open platform that engineered for a wide variety of qPCR applications with high sensitivity. It has been proven to deliver trustworthy data in the sense of reproducibility and also uniformity. These are the two highlights in Azul Cielo. First, it has an innovative 16-well fiber optic system, allows dedicated well scanning with higher excitation and detection efficiency. Therefore, it eliminates the need to normalize inter-well differences using passive reference dyes such as rocks. Second, more than 100,000 pixels are detected within a given well, thereby increasing data reliability and reproducibility. The dedicated scanning of each well also means less background noises in the signal detection. Azul Cielo comes with two models, which are uh, Azul Cielo 3 and Cielo 6. Cielo 3 has three optical modules, and Cielo 6 has a total of six optical modules for a wide variety of dyes, such as Cyber Green, VIX and HEX. Tamra, 
rocks, sci-fi, and sci-fi.5. If you're interested in our flagship uh, Azure CLO real-time PCR systems, please check out our official website, or you can contact our regional distributors for more details. Even though Azure Bio Systems is based in the United States, we have global sales and support team available for you. These are our US team member. And I'm Kyling, the regional field application scientist, and I work with Nicole, Vikram, and our fellow members to support Asia and Oceania region. Thank you for your time here to with us today. If you have any inquiries, feel free to contact us via the email shown uh, on the screen, or you can contact your local distributor and we will follow up from there. Thanks again for joining this webinar, and we shall open the floor for a discussion session. Thank you.